I fully intended to do this video during December, during December, but now we're moving into dos annuary, maybe. I had flu in December and Christmas happened, some family stuff, and this video didn't get completed, but here it is now. And this is something I'd wanted to do for quite a while. I've got the IBM 5170 and that scratches an itch for my original PC nostalgia. But as I moved on, I moved on to more 486 and Pentium machines. I'd like one of those so I can play some of the games that I had at that point, like Doom and Quake maybe. At the heart of this build, the motherboard I'm using is a Baby AT form factor, but one with a difference. It's actually a Pentium 3 with PCI, ISA and AGP slots, which is quite late in the AT form factor. Most things had moved to ATX by this point. This should result in a fairly capable DOS gaming machine. The processor I've got in this is a Celeron 433, but that should be more than adequate to run Quake and Doom at a reasonable frame rate. And the graphics card I've got for this build is an ATI Rage Pro. I have a lot of love for the early ATI cards, and this specific model is one I had in one of my earlier, probably Citrix 586 machines. And the other must-have peripheral for this build is a Pico Gus, because I want something that'll give me the ability to have pretty much any sound card, be that the Gravis Ultrasound or Sound Blaster. And I'll be trying out that MIDI using a Yamaha drum machine, the DTS Express. The advantage of this model is that it's basically a very, very capable Yamaha synthesizer. And if that wasn't enough projects to ram into one machine, we're going to be using the Blue Scuzzy. Mainly because I love this device, but secondly because it has functionality for emulating a CD-ROM drive. But the interesting thing about this build is going to be the case. I want to build something different. The basis for this is going to be a fairly bog standard beige case. I'm looking to replace the front bezel of this machine with something made out of wood and in a steampunk type style. By adding some steampunky bracketry stuff on it, it'll look fine, hopefully. I need somebody who's much better at woodwork than me. And that's where Mike enters the picture. He's a very accomplished craftsman. He does quite a lot of woodwork. In fact, he's pretty much always got a piece of wood in his hand. And that's because he generally makes longbows. He also shoots them as well. He's a huge archery enthusiast. And that's why this video doesn't start with anything to do with building a retro 80 based beige box PC. We're gonna start by repairing a relatively old external SATA hard drive. The reason we're starting with that is because this belongs to Mike and he had an accident. He managed to drop it with the cable plugged in and it completely ripped the USB connector from the board, taking the pads, some traces and chunks of PCB with it. I offered to repair this and in return he's offered to make me the front for my new steampunk inspired case. So without further ado, let's have a look at this external SATA drive. The first thing I've got to do is to mechanically attach this to the board. So electrically, we will need to make some connections and bodges. This USB port was reliant on its pads to hold it to the board, but those pads are completely missing. What I've done is used a very blobby soldery technique to attach the first of these prongs to the board. The second thing I'm going to attach is the one pad that still remains on the connector. I've now got two points of contact and effectively it's staying in the right place. Now I don't have to worry about it moving around. By scraping off some of the solder mask and exposing some copper, I can create a, a pad I can bridge to with lots more super blobby soldering. And the same again on the other side scratching off the solder mask, adding some flux, and then doing some super blobby soldering. As far as mechanical connection to the board goes, that is as good as it's going to get. Now I'm going to turn my attention to connecting the rest of the port's connectors. Two of them are just to ground, so they're fairly easy. I'm actually going to use a very similar technique by scraping off some solder mask and doing some more super blobby soldering. 
I don't really intend to get a huge blob of solder onto this nice bit of gold via fencing that's around the edge of the board. In order so I can see what I'm doing, I'm having to clean up as I go, which means I'm going to be doing quite a lot of rubbing down with isopropyl alcohol and desoldering and tidying flux up and then adding more flux. Now I'm going to add some new solder to what's left of what I assume is an inductor. This would have been a dual data line inductor. The problem is it appears to have exploded probably when a large short happened as the USB connector was ripped off. So I've removed the remnants of that and I can't really replace it because I don't know what value it was. I've even looked at the data sheet and there's nothing in there about having an inductor. In my frantic soldering I appear to have dislodged a resistor so I'll need to add some flux and get that back into its correct position. And then we can move on to what to do about this inductor. I can't replace it because I don't know what the value was. So I'm going to replicate what I've found online on other boards and that's just straight through. All the bodge wires in place now. Now we can add a bit more mechanical support by adding lots of hot glue. This is also going to act as a kind of pseudo solder mask. So I didn't really want to put solder mask onto the board then only to put hot glue onto that. There is something weirdly satisfying about melting hot glue with an air gun. Though it is quite difficult to do when you don't have any depth perception using a microscope. You also sort of lose a weird perspective on how small the things you're actually working on are because you're staring at this big screen. It's only when you try introducing tools into that space that you start to realize that what you're working on is absolutely tiny. Some more hot glue around the sides. Again, straight onto the pads and solder and board. Try and give it as much of a mechanical connection to the PCB as possible. Sponsors of this video are PCB Way. They provide PCB prototype fabrication from as little as $5. They also have a huge library of shared projects. And if you're not confident with a soldering iron, you can even get them to assemble them for you. PCB Way also have CNC machining and 3D printing services. All of this is available at PCBWay.com. Thanks PCBWay for sponsoring this video. All back together in its nice attachy case everything looks like it's never been touched and it fired up first time and i was able to access data i've got it to show you because this is mike's personal data moving on to the next part is to build a blue scuzzy now my intent was to use this purple pico clone these are readily available on the internet and are fantastic. What I didn't realize at this point is they're actually a different pinout to the original Raspberry Pi Pico, meaning what I'm doing here is soldering something that's wholly incompatible directly onto a blue SCSI. I didn't really find this out until I tried to put the firmware on. Basically, connecting the USB gave power to the blue SCSI board but I wasn't able to get the boot option to work on the Pico. So I unsoldered it and then I was able to put the firmware onto the Pico, no problem. I soldered it back on again, thinking I'd probably just shorted one of the pins somehow when it was soldered on the first time. No, completely dead. It was only then I looked at the back of it and realized it actually has more GPO outputs exposed and less grounds. So it's basically, when connected, grounding one of the pins permanently, and it doesn't like that. So the final version is back to having a Pico W. I'll maybe do an adapter board at some later point. Moving on to the motherboard. The next thing I'm going to assemble is the Pico Gus, and thankfully that comes with everything already soldered on the board. 
it's just a matter of attaching the slot bracket so that it fits in the case nicely. You can see this has a USB port on it and two 3.5mm jacks. One is audio out, the other is for the MIDI adapter, which when you buy it from a reseller, as I did, you get that provided. At this point, I'd like to give a big thanks and shout out to Derek. Derek is the owner of a little company called Flame Lily. Flame Lily are the UK authorised distributor for PicoGus, Pico Mem, and Blue Scuzzy, amongst many other projects. Derek's a fantastic guy, and if you get the opportunity to see him at a show, go over and say hello, and tell him that Hack Build Restore sent you. He's a very friendly guy and gives excellent service. You can get to the Flame Lily shop by clicking on the link in the description below, or using the QR code that's on screen here. So let's take some time to put this whole machine together, putting a couple of very, very good magazines underneath the board so that the slot brackets don't foul the table. Plugging in power, my start button, the DTS Express, connect that to MIDI, insert our AGP graphics card, the ATI Rage Pro, connect us up to capture, and contact. Everything fires up first time. I've already configured the blue SCSI off camera. There was a little bit of research went into this and I'll cover everything that you see me doing with this blue SCSI later on in this video. The first thing I'm going to try playing Terry Pratchett's Discworld. So we should get a fairly good soundtrack to prove that everything's working. a second-hand set of dimensions in an astral plane that was never meant to fly. Somewhere in darkest Ankh-Morpork, a sinister plot is about to unfold. So on the blue SCSI SD card, we've got two folders, one named CD1, the other named FD2. And that's because the CD-ROM drive is on ID1 and the floppy disk is on ID2. There's also the HD, which is just a raw image. In the FD folder, we've got three MS-DOS install disks and on CD1, we've got four CDs. You'll notice when I used it, these don't come out in alphabetical order. I think this is a slight bug in Blue Scuzzy. We've also got a shared folder, which I haven't shown being used, but you can actually write files to that shared folder and read from it. The Blue Scuzzy Ini just defines everything explicitly. So Scuzzy Zero is the hard drive, it's standard quirks off, then the CD-ROM drive, and then the floppy drive. 
In my blue SCSI folder, I have some additional batch files that I've written. The first of which is CDLS, which gives you a list of the CD images. This is just using the SCSI toolbox, passing the ID of the CD-ROM drive. Then it lists all the available images. Insert.bat, also using SCSI toolbox, and sets the image to the one you've selected. An FD Next, which is using part of EZ SCSI from Adaptech, a tool called RMV Tool, and that allows me to eject the floppy drive. To get that tool, it's on disk two of the Easy SCSI install disks. It doesn't install as part of the DOS install, it installs as part of the Windows install, which I don't get the option for because I haven't installed Windows. But you can manually expand that file by using the expand command, which is on the disk, and expand rmvtool.exe underscore to rmvtool.exe in whichever folder you want it to be in. You can then use that tool to eject disks, either CD-ROMs or, in this case, floppy disks. And what Blue SCSI does when you eject the floppy disk is it puts the next one in the drive. So I've started out with disk 3 and now I've got disk 1 and now I've got disk 2. Unfortunately it doesn't automatically map to A so I've basically used the subst command to map it to D which is where the drive is. The caveat is it only appears to work with Adaptech Easy SCSI and that only works with Adaptech SCSI cards. So now I've got the internals all built, I need to turn my hand to the case. But that's going to be a subject for another video. A shout out to my new patrons, Cathers and Envoy CDX. Welcome to the RetroGlow community. And if you find any part of this video entertaining or informative, then please click like. And if you want to find out what happens with this machine, then click subscribe so you'll get a notification when I release my next video. But for now, why don't you try this video next?